I'm Beth Haverkamp. I'm Associate Dean for Grad Programs and Research in the Faculty of Education. Um, just I'm so pleased that you're all going to be considering this opportunity. It's really important. I'm very happy to say that our students in Faculty of Education and in Kinesiology have continue to have one of the highest success rates in the country for grad funding. So I think that's because we do such a good job choosing you and inviting you to come, but it's also because of the wonderful work that you do. What we're going to be doing today is we have a series of questions. We didn't pass out copies of this this year. We're trying to do our best to, to save trees, but there is a website that we can show you where you can actually receive a copy of this. It's an important document because in addition to deadlines, which I'll say a word about, it also includes samples of successful applications from different disciplinary perspectives, and that's a really important resource in terms of getting a sense of the style of academic writing that's expected, as well as some other information resources. Um, and we're going to welcome your questions as we go along. I, I did want to call your attention, however, to the deadlines. Um, one of the ways this works is that particularly for the SHRC applications, those must go through a, a departmental review and adjudication before they go on to the Faculty of Grad Studies at the PhD level. So we have a departmental deadline, and that is Monday, September 22nd. It actually says departmental deadline for SHRC, NSERC, and affiliated. So that also applies to NSERC natural sciences if you're in kinesiology. If you're applying to CIHR, Canadian Institute of Health Research, that's Monday, October 1st and it's a direct application to CIHR. That does not go through your department. And then when they go to grad studies, they do a review, make a decision for what goes on to Ottawa. If you're a master's student, you have a different set of deadlines. Your application is due on Monday, December 1st as an online application. And let me ask quickly now, how many of you are master's students? Wonderful, that's fantastic. Wow. How many doctoral students? Nice, nice balance, that's great. So certainly many of the issues in terms of what makes a good application, engaging with references, are exactly the same. So we shouldn't have any trouble with that. Um, I think that's what I'll say for now. We'll get right to our panelists. So if you, uh, we have a series of questions. And the first one I'll ask people to address. What makes an excellent program of study description? So that you as might part not of know. But I only have an hour, so I arranged to go first and to do all my answers. I think that would be fine. We'll hear from you. <laughs> 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 right, I'm here, going to do so. it this way. Yeah. If, if you could do, let's just go for it. Okay. And if, and if somebody, if I you say I'll something. I promise I'll answer all the questions and uh, give you plenty of time to ask me questions before I have to run off. And okay. what I, the only thing I would ask yeah. is that you may something you may say something that Cynthia oh, yeah. or Jordan or George wants to elaborate on, and so if we can insert at that point, Absolutely. and then we'll just see how it goes. For sure. Great. So okay. Mary, <laughs> Dr. Bryson. So what I've done is to provide you with a handout. I've sat on the Shirk and Affiliated Award Adjudication Committees at the department, the faculty, the university, and the Ottawa level. And so what I've done is to try to summarize my recommendations. This is my 26th year at the University of British Columbia. And I think it's fair to say that the students I work with have an extremely high rate of success in SHRC, CIHR, and affiliated award applications. So there's some reason to have confidence in my recommendations. They're, they've been tested in the SHRC affiliated award kitchen. I put doctoral. <laughs> Shirk an affiliated award at the top of the list, but what I want to draw your attention to is that really the only specifications that are particularly relevant for doctoral Shirk and affiliated pertain to publications. So everything else is totally relevant whether you're an MA or a PhD applicant. So the first thing I want to say is that applying to Shirk CIHR and affiliated award competitions is a game. It's a competitive game. And if you're going to play the game, and I'm really glad that you are because we're very successful in education, you want to play to win. It's a competitive game. And it's a game where at all of the levels, proposals are ranked. So my first piece of advice is only A grade proposals are funded. They're not actually graded literally A, B, C, D, but they are. 
in terms of being ranked, and it's only the proposals in the A range that are going to go on to the next step. So therefore, you really need to find out everything that you can do so that you can push the probability of your proposal being getting that nice fat red A at the top so that your proposal can go forward. So how are you going to do that? The fact that you're here at graduate school, a really great graduate school, probably the best faculty of education in Canada, means that you already have what it takes to be successful. So what does that look like concretely? First of all, feedback from your supervisor. Feedback from your supervisor is one of the most important ways that you can improve your proposal from where you begin. And if you're very fortunate, you'll be beginning at the B level. Your proposal at this point is probably a B, and you need to push it into the A range. How are you going to do that? You have to help your supervisor, who is an inordinately busy person, to value your proposal. So how are you going to do that? First of all, give them a lot of time. I've said two months here. Well, you don't have two months, but you get the idea. They have to have enough time to read it and to give you feedback. Secondly, you have to use some kind of technology, whatever your supervisor decides works best for them. It might be paper. They might want you to use Dropbox. You have to have a way that you work out with your supervisor that you can give them a draft of that proposal. They can turn on track changes or however they work. They can make those improvements, those suggestions to you, get it back to you. You follow up. You immediately make those changes. You get it back to them. You get the idea. Make use of whatever technology your supervisor uses so that you can really support them to support you. Make sure that your supervisor can write you a really strong letter. You may be in your first year. Your supervisor perhaps hasn't read whatever publication, if you're a PhD student, hopefully you have a publication or you're working on a publication. Make sure that you make it possible for them to read that publication so that they can refer to that publication in their letter. I can guarantee you I've probably read many thousands of letters at this point. All the letters that sound the same have no impact. Everybody says, this is great, this person is great, this project is really important. You need the letter about your application to sound different. How can it sound different? You need there to be details in that letter. Your supervisor needs to notice that you presented a paper at an important international peer-reviewed conference. Help your supervisor to notice that. They're dealing with thousands of documents. Give them a cheat sheet. Here's some information how to interpret my CV so that you can write the best possible letter for me. And part of that, I've been very determined in my language here, no spam filler on the CV. So my example here is uh, uh, if, you're, if you've given a talk to the local golfing association about your research, that's not a peer-reviewed publication. It may be, uh, in recognition of my colleagues in human kinetics, I added the detail <laughs> that it may be that if you're doing human kinetics work on golf swings and RSIs, it may be that your talk about golfing is a peer-reviewed publication, but it's really clear what a peer-reviewed publication or a peer-reviewed conference is. If you did a fireside chat somewhere, that shouldn't be on your CV. Filler, spam on the CV takes away from those achievements that you actually have, and it will result in your proposal being pushed down, not up. Critical feedback. Make sure that your supervisor understands that you're taking care of yourself emotionally so that you're strong enough to hear critical feedback. It isn't great. It's not great at all. I live on the campus, so I spend a lot of my life walking back and forth with my dog. I hear a lot of what students have to say in passing. My supervisor loved my proposal. That's actually a disaster. It's not good that the super because there are things 
your supervisor can tell you about your proposal that are going to make it much stronger. If they say they loved it, you have no idea if they've even read it. And it could be that there are one or two things in that proposal that will sink it. And you really need your supervisor to know that you are able emotionally to hear some really critical feedback. I'm sure because they're in education, they will have the basic idea that first they say something very pleasant. <laughs> this is so much stronger than the last version. I really like the way, but then you really need them to tell you how you can make it better. But you need to teach your supervisor that you are well, you're strong enough to hear critical feedback. In fact, you welcome it. Make sure that you convey that to your supervisor. Make sure you check your emotional responses to critical feedback. And make sure that you have a support system so that if you have a supervisor who's really busy and who just gets right to the point about what you can do to improve your proposal, you can deal with how you're feeling about that somewhere else because what they're telling you is gold. It's incredibly important and it will help you to push that proposal up in the pile. Use headings. I can't tell you how many proposals I get without headings. And I, I, it's almost impossible to read. I've included a set of pretty robust headings here, example headings. Make sure that you use something in this general order of things, where you have some kind of overview of the program of research, something that indicates the theoretical background, something that gives a significant amount of detail concerning the methodology, the significance of the research. You must be able to answer the so what question. And you can only do that by being very clear about what your argument is concerning why this proposal should be funded. And please, if you only remember one thing from what I said today, please don't think that your proposal is a summary of what you're actually planning to do for your research. A lot of people make this mistake. It's not. Your proposal is a brochure. You want the brochure to be highly successful as it goes through the process of being read and ranked. Of course, I'm not saying to you, make up a project that has nothing to do with your program of research. But don't be too literal about it. Make sure you may not know, for example, how many participants do I need to, how many people do I need to interview for a master study or for a doctoral study? Where am I going to find my participants? Those kinds of questions. In your proposal, you need to have a reasonable response, a reasonable explanation in terms of how these things are described in the field where you're working, not how many people you're actually going to talk to. So make sure that the proposal as a whole is really complete. It may be that actually you're really not sure how you're going to, in fact, create your interview protocol, but you need to create a description of that process at this point that sounds like you really know what you're talking about. Um, make sure, it's very common advice for people who are writing proposals that they should address a gap in the existing research. And so it's really common for people to say something like, there's been very little research carried out so far on X, whatever X is, and then they stop. But the problem with that is that you haven't told me the so what. Maybe there's very little research because it's a completely insignificant question. Or it's a question about the meaning of life that research can't actually answer. So make sure that you make it very clear to the readers that there's a gap in the literature, there's a gap in the research, your research plausibly will allow us to advance knowledge concerning that gap, and so what? And how will it make a difference that we know more about X, whatever X is? And 
finally, signposting. I can't emphasize this enough. So what do I mean by signposting? In the handout that I've given you, you can kind of see uh, in the Xeroxing, the yellow highlighter looks a little bit different than it does up here, but the grayed out text, that's signposting. So signpost the rhetorical bones of your argument. Typically, I work in areas of research, as do my students, in queer, transgender, in sexuality studies related to social justice. Right now, I'm working on a project which travels under the general heading of queer cancer, which may seem very obscure to someone reading about this for the first time. However, it's Canada's first nationally funded project that looks at gender and sexuality and cancer. So how was I able to get this proposal funded? How was my student, Evan Taylor, whose own doctoral CIHR award proposal was funded, and Evan ended up being, I don't know, something like ranked seventh in his first year out of like 700 proposals. I've given you the first page of Evan's proposal is also in here by signposting. What is signposting? Signposting is language that tells the reader there's an argument here. So, narratives of cancer research paradigmatically articulate. In this article, by contrast, our relationality to cancer research. Our primary questions our trajectory. All of these are phrases that you could take right out of here and put in your proposal because what do they do? They help the reader to follow along. Oh, they're going to tell me what it is that they're doing that's different than what everybody else does. Or, whereas there has been by now. So, previous research. If you I've given you two sample doctoral award proposals that were ranked extremely highly, one for CIHR, one for SHRP. And I've done the same thing. I've highlighted the signposting. So here's Evan Taylor's CIHR proposals. So what does he do? He starts out talking about what it is that the project focuses on, and then he goes on to identify that there's only a very small body of research on the subject that he's interested in pursuing, transgender folks and cancer screening. And then he goes on to talk about where there's no research evidence, how his project addresses this gap, why it's significant. Research results will advance knowledge concerning gender identity and healthcare decision making. It's really, really feasible for you to undertake even the most initially perhaps obscure or little understood problem. And by using signposting in your proposal, by go through it. I have all of my students do this. I get them to get their highlighter out and highlight where the signposting is. If there isn't a lot of signposting, put it in. There are other proposals, successful proposals, in the handout that's being provided to you here. And literally, I see no, I have no ethical qualms with people borrowing those phrases. This research will advance knowledge by, that's not plagiarism. Every proposal should include that phrase. So make sure that you take a look at that. Here's another, perhaps we might think, uh, wow, how interesting. The Michigan Women's Music Festival and the Queer Persistence of Feminism. I tried to pick some, what we might think of as, in some ways, less, um, less immediately obvious subjects for research, all of which have fared extremely well. So here's another proposal. Look at the first sentence. This dissertation research is designed so as to advance knowledge concerning contemporary conceptions of. 
that is the kind of opening sentence that you need so that you can clearly communicate to the person reading your proposal what is it why does it matter if you can do that if you can enlist your supervisor's support in helping you to make that proposal as good as it can be if you're a doctoral student and by the second year you have that one publication that you need to have on your CV whatever it takes you need that publication uh, and my suggestion in my handout for you as to how to do that get involved with your supervisor's program of research find out if they have a pile of data somewhere that you can help them to move toward publication have that conversation about authorship up front so that you know that this will add a publication to your CV in whatever way that you can those are the kinds of things that will allow you to be successful great thanks Mary <coughs> Mary's given us a great overview of the topics we want to talk about this afternoon and particularly want to say thanks for the handout being able to have that takeaway I think is really useful um, I'm sh one of the things I know from experience is that when those of us who are up here begin talking about these issues it can also generate some anxiety because you all are beginning this at different stages of the process um, I think that and that's absolutely fine we have people who will put in a uh, proposal the first year they'll get good feedback they may not be successful good chance of being successful the second year so I think engaging in this you're getting a great beginning on defining the research areas you want to do rather than go back with questions to Mary now because I think that our other panelists may also have things to say that will address some of those questions let's kind of go back to the beginning Mary identified a number of things that um, help create an excellent program of study which is really the heart of the proposal so I'd ask maybe Cynthia why don't you jump in and then we'll ask George and Jordan as well for their thoughts yeah, I don't, uh, Mary's was just amazing. I think you used your own advice in presenting what you actually put up of the A grade. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know what more I can add to that except to maybe say um, in designing a really good proposal, and I, oh, I should just mention, I have also sat on the same boards as Mary in terms of evaluating the proposals at the department level and at the university level, not at the um, national level, but both with the Killam and the Shirk and the affiliated awards. So um, we have experience at looking at hundreds of proposals, and we need to read over 100 proposals and rank them. So you can see that the advice that Mary suggested there, the points to think about in trying to make your proposal stand out, both with the, what the content of it as well as the referees and how they write their letters, is extremely important. And when I'm reading um, proposals, what I'm really looking for very clearly and quickly is that there's a real good statement of the problem which Mary mentioned, so very quickly, and I, I can get that from the title, and I can also get that from the subheadings. So it's really important to title your proposal with something that's going to give me a sense of what is, what's coming up in the rest of the two-pager that you're, you're writing. And that needs to be right up front, so I get a sense of where I am and why this is important, and then what you're going to do, how you're going to actually answer that question. And then uh, at the end of it, a description on the so what, but also a description about how you are the best person to do this proposal. So a little bit about your own, what you bring to it, so that your experiences in the in uh, previous coursework or in the past and your leadership capacity, what is it that you bring to this that makes you the best person to do this research? And in that paragraph, you can also write a bit about uh, what you recognize that are some of the things you need to work on in order to do and complete this research. So it might be that you're going to take a course in a particular um, methodology or some statistics that you might want to take or other qualitative research in order to advance your understanding of this particular field so that you can do the best job possible. So recognizing what it is that you have and what it is that you need to learn more about is also something you can include in the proposal. So I think that's probably the masters, I know we have a lot of masters students too, you are in a better position because you can use the two months as Mary said, to, to get yourself, if you haven't already, started working towards. And I think our success rate uh, for the masters is very high. I know in our department it's pretty much one to one. So if you submit one uh, in our department, well, we've had the students I've worked with and as well as others, um, usually it's uh, approved. 
So, but the same uh, thinking in terms of setting up the proposal is something to, to, to consider. Um, but I think that your marks are really important more so with the masters than it is with the... That's true, that at the masters level, they're looking for potential, so your, your GPA does become more important and your marks. Anything else you can add to that? your proposal, the content of it. At the doctoral level, the proposal itself, the design, how you develop a rationale is more important. But let me go to Jordan and George for what you would add. Maybe going to a student perspective. <laughs> Jordan, as you thought about this, what were you, or what advice did you get about what you should focus on in that program of study? Well, I think a lot of the things Mary said, for sure, um, kind of hit the, the nail on the head. The one thing that I would add, and this, it might sound almost redundant, but you really need to ensure that when you lay out your question and when you lay out your hypothesis, when you lay out your methods, that it is very clear to the reader that your methods can answer your question. Great Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in uh, all of the different things that you want to do, but mm -hmm. you have to remember that the person reading the application probably is not in your field. And it needs to just be very, very obvious that what you are going to do answers that question. You need to make the methods easily understandable, even if they're incredibly complex. And I'd add to that that for those of you who are doing qualitative projects, making sure that there's, there's consistency between the question or area of inquiry and the method that you're choosing. So for example, if you're doing something that's narrative, um, you need to make sure that your method of, if you're asking about stories and life stories, say in teaching, you need to make sure that your description of your method is narrative and fits that question, as opposed to going on to the lived experience or the meaning of. If, you're, if your question is a story question, make sure your method is a story method, and that that consistency goes all the way through the proposal. George. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and the, uh, I think the, what, what Mary and Cynthia have already offered, are, it's, uh, it is gold in terms of um, what, what I've experienced as well. Like both my colleagues, I've sat on the department, faculty, and university level for a few years for adjudicating um, proposals, and I've done a fair amount of adjudicating for faculty awards, which you know, are, are similar in, um, in the spirit of what, what, what makes a, a winning award or not. One of the things that I would uh, like to add is that, uh, or I'd like to assure you, is that a lot of the adjudication, it's like we go through different processes where there's two people looking at the files, um, at the same file, and even though someone's from HKIN, or in, someone's, in some cases I, I work on committees where there's someone from sociology and they're looking, most often, more often than not, we actually hit, we rank that file similarly. So just trust that people across different disciplines read the work pretty in pretty similar ways. And um, so there, there, there's a sense of uh, who is reading it are people who have read fairly widely, but they're looking for a hunch or a gut feeling. And how do you get those guts and hunches and uh, are usually through those signposts, those various things that um, have been articulated for you. So I just want you to trust that it's not kind of haphazard. A good proposal will usually be a good proposal by many. It's not, oh, I just lucked into this particular pool. You might have, but that's rare. The title was mentioned, and I think that you should spend a lot of time on the title. Mm -hmm. A lot of time. Because you have to imagine that Cynthia's on this committee. She receives, let's say, 100 files while she is trying to do her own research, while she's teaching, and I'm not trying to say that academics are super, super like, busy, but many of us have lots to do. <laughs> and those hundred files, so she might spend four to five minutes if, if all is good on one application. So if she has to plod through your, your language and she can't hit those signposts, you, you've, you've lost her. She's already kind of put you into the B range. So I guess what you have to think about once you've written it is that these people are going to spend, we're not speed reading them through, uh, through them, but we're looking for certain things right away. So you have to help us as the readers. And that's all of us who are reading these files are always that way. So think about who's reading it. And um, so the title is the, the first catch, that first sentence, the last sentence, the layout, all those, the aesthetics of it really matters. If you're trying, oh, I just want to try to say one more thing in there, I, I need to squeeze that in you probably would have been way better off not to squeeze that in and give us the space and the breath to read it. 
So that aesthetic is, um, it, it actually counts for more because than you think. Because we're looking at, again, think about it, 100 applications, mm -hmm. and if it's like, if it's too dense, too thick, too, and I'm, my first impression is somewhere. So that's uh, another, another, and I think the, uh, another point that I want to highlight, in terms of your topic, don't be afraid. If you feel very passionate about the Haida Gwaii Community Theater uh, project, that, go with that. It's not, because you we, we see the, those specific projects and we also see 21st century learning technologies and, and the, the bigger questions. Those buzzwords, buzz ones, if it's just buzz, we see through them. So it, the whole range, the whole gamut, it's, I just read, I don't know if you've read uh, The Wives of Los Alamos. It's, it's about the, 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 the wives of all the scientists in uh, New Mexico. And it's a, it's a wonderful read, and, but it talks... The, the, the wives loved being there, they hated being there. The, the children were so educated there, there was no education. It, it goes kind of back and forth, and it, what that book taught me, and it, like, it depends the perspective, but as the book moves forward, you kind of get an essence and a spirit of, of what was actually happening there. So your proposals also should be, sometimes it, it can be here and there, but we have to get the, the, the full essence of it. Um, the last thing that I'll add to this is um, a lot of us and you spend, I would say sometimes up to 80 to 90% of the time on the proposal and then on the CV part of things, you might spend like that 10%. We evaluate, um, for the masters it's more weighted towards the, the, the proposal, but for the PhDs I can't remember what the exact calibration, I think it depends which committee. But sometimes your CV um, for, let's say, PhDs might count up to 60 or 70 percent, and you've spent 10 percent of your time on that. Do, do pay diligence to how you present that, and the, I think the, the filler stuff doesn't work, definitely doesn't work. It does bring down your application. All, it, it brings it down. If you, it, you have to put things there that are relevant. You're in the scholarly environment. You're competing against the best and brightest people in the country, so you've got to play, as Mary began, it's a game, if you want, you've got to be in the game, um, and you just keep keep going at it. Um, it doesn't make you less of a person because you don't have the pieces for that game, but it just reminds you maybe that these are the pieces that will make you successful in this game. Mm -hmm. But do pay attention to the CV. Um, I, I see some students that I, I know them, they're not necessarily my students, and I know that they've done other things and they haven't included it or they've just kind of framed it in a way that didn't quite work. And you're, you are compared. You are compared to others, because we have to rank you. So um, you have to stand out honestly. And uh, so I'll end there. I guess the only thing I'd add, in terms of the proposal, and George alluded to it, because this is going to be read by people from other disciplines, clarity and accessibility are critical. So. For some of us, as we're moving into areas that have their own specialized language, that can be important as a signal to people in that discipline that you're familiar with that literature or with that language. But you need to make certain that it's understandable to people from other areas. I think those of you working in more postmodern areas, this is a particular issue. And the more familiar you are, the more essential those words sometimes can feel. If you think it's really important to use some of that less familiar language, put a comma, add a phrase that alerts a reader what it is you're trying to communicate in much more straightforward language. Because I know that complaints about jargon are one of the bits of feedback we get back that your, reader, your readers can't assess how innovative and strong your ideas are if they don't fully understand what you're proposing. So, and I think as George said, you know, what is that essence? Get that there in the beginning because on the first pass, reviewers are going to be scanning for things that jump out, things that those those signposts of you know thoughtfulness, rigor, uh, and if they catch those, then they can go back and spend more time. But making your purpose um, really clear at the outset, I'd say, is important. Mary, coming back to you, anything else you want to add on that bit before we go on to um, sort of some of the mechanics? Okay. Yeah, oh yeah, we should ask, do you have questions at this point? We've been talking a lot. Yeah. Where's the line in terms of, like, they have no publications? Like, my 
designer presentations. I can like, I was talking to my advisor, he was like, oh, it'd be like, I said, oh, I wrote a group manual once. And I put that on there. Is that filler? Is that good? I think that if you feel like you can make an argument in your head for its academic relevance, put it in. Okay. Um, I think the other thing I'd add, because I want to acknowledge that all of you are likely to be at different stages in this process. If you're just beginning your grad career, you know, this is very new to you. What some of our panelists are describing are, these are the things that are really going to get you there, national level competition, to be successful. It's very, very important for you to know what those are because if you're not successful this year, that gives you a great idea of what you want to be doing in the next 12 months until you get to next year. You're also being evaluated at your department level. So there may be things that at the national level will not be as compelling, but if you go ahead and list them, they may help you build your reputation within your department. I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, as long as you're clear that, well, gosh, I wish I had something else to put here, but I'm going to go ahead and put the invited talk I gave to my school district because it's close enough and it wasn't peer reviewed, but it is relevant to the area in which I'm working, so I'm going to go ahead and put it down because I want to put something in that space. At this stage, I think that's fine. I don't know what other folks would say, but, but as long as you recognize that as it moves up, you want to have those peer reviewed talks, conferences, publications. Would other people comment on I that or say differently? I think the main thing is that you need to have a game plan. Yeah. And so here's the issue. The thing is that to carry out research that a peer-reviewed academic journal will publish, to collect the data, whatever that looks like, to spend time in your archive, to write it up, that's a long haul. So your challenge is how can I have something to put on that line on the peer-reviewed publications line next year, mm -hmm. given the cycle of publication. And so there are several ways that you can do that. I mentioned getting involved with your supervisor or another colleague's program of research where there's already data. There may be data that are in some way close to being analyzed where you can get involved, even if you're not the first author, if it's a publication in a peer-reviewed journal, that is worth a lot. If you have given a talk at a conference and you haven't published it, then get that file, print it out, make an appointment to talk to your advisor and figure out how you can do something with that talk in order to convert it into a publication. Some ways that people get started with peer-reviewed publication is through an essay review. So let's say you don't have data, I don't think a book review is a very useful way to get started because it doesn't count for enough points as a publication. But many journals publish essay reviews. That is a publication and you don't need original data for it. You simply need to be very familiar with a given field. How do you do that? Well, as you're working your way into your comprehensives, as you're writing papers, I tell all my students, don't tell me you're writing a paper for your classes when they're still doing classes. I want you to be writing papers for publication that you also hand in as assignments in your classes. It's a different mindset. You really, I think, need to think about everything that you write. Is this a publication? If it isn't, why? Why not? Why would you write anything that isn't in some way being directed toward appearing in some place in print. And then the last thing I'll say about that is don't take shortcuts. So if somebody, which could seem a bit contradictory, because I'm saying publish, 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 but also slow down. So, <laughs> <laughs> so don't, if somebody tells you, oh, there's this really great online, and I don't want to say, you know, online publications are bad, it's too much of a generalization, but if there's the, the journal of everything and they have a 100% acceptance rate and yes. there no nobody that anybody would ever recognize is on their editorial board, don't send it there because that's not going to help you out either. However, the main point is to make a plan so that the time and energy that you have is pretty much, and this is more again for the PhD students, 
MA level proposal, 70% of the score of the weighting of your application is based on your academic achievement. But for the doctoral applicants, about 70% of the score of the weighting is a combination of your proposal, your awards, and your publications. So there, you really need to be thinking about how can everything that I write end up as a publication. And of course, it won't be everything, but if there's even something, one thing, I can tell you that the one real publication, already only 20 to 30 percent of the proposals actually of the applications have publications. So it's worth it to try to figure out how to make that work. I just want to clarify, because when Cynthia mentioned the master's, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the master's, uh, because half of you seem to be in the master's pool, um, is now university um, allocated. Yes. So we get X amount at UBC for master's uh, awards for Shirk and, and Cirque, and, whereas in the past it used to go to Ottawa. So I, because I, I, last year our success rate in education was very high. But I, I'm not sure we, if it was uh, the university was higher now, but we did very well in education, and partly is because they were they were very well written, mm -hmm. and there to address the because I think we're talking about publications, 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 and uh, the uh, it's for the PhDs. I would say it's hard. It, it's very hard without a publication to be successful. It's not impossible. There's been successful people without publications, but at the master's level, it's definitely not as much mm -hmm. of, of an because you think beginning a master's, I mean, aside from the folks in psychology, which um, they seem to publish in their first year or even in high school, um, that <laughs> literally you see these CVs. But all of us are aware of that when we sit on those committees because it's the trend in psychology that they've published a whole lot. And I would say my, our colleagues in H. Kin start, start earlier than oh, other yeah. fields. But we, we recognize that. The people on these, these adjudication committees go that the, the, the culture of, of publication varies in pl from place to place. So, uh, yeah. Yes. So for master's students, um, I know you're saying that obviously some people have publications and that's not really as important. But if you had um, a publication or something like a, or a conference that in your undergrad thesis that wasn't related <coughs> to what you're doing now, is that not okay to put on your CV or does It was a publication that you had a chance to participate in even though it's not related to your thesis? If it's a, absolutely, yeah, if it's, it's an academic good. publication, good for you. put it in. Yeah, that's great because you were part of a research team. Mm -hmm. Part of what you want to think too about what all of these different entries are meant to communicate or what the reviewers are looking for. They're looking for evaluations by other people that your work is good. Um, that you've been invited to do things, that you've, uh, you've got, that's what peer review is. Somebody else that says this is good work. So you already are showing that you're participating in that academic conversation by having had another publication or being part of a research team. Um, and I think too, for some of you, and particularly at the master's level, but perhaps to consider at the doctoral level as well, that there may be professional outlets where you've done some writing. And it, that is something that you might, even if it isn't peer reviewed, it might be something you would want to consider because you're contributing to the conversation in an academic way in your area. So if that's, if you've got something like that, don't leave them off and your supervisor will be your best advice about, about whether to include something or not. There was a question in the back earlier. Yes, I was curious, if you're applying to CIHR, you were saying that we don't go through the department, but if we're still looking to maybe have to put in a separate um, application for the 22nd? Oh, uh, I bet you do. Let me ask one of my for, staff. For master's or doctoral, doctoral, you have to put in a separate application. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but am I using the same formatting as I would use for the CIA for that, or should I use the SHRP guidelines? I, I thought it was sure, but that would be something to check maybe with your department. And, and what we can do is afterwards, uh, in my office, Christine Walsworth, I think would be a good, who introduced the program initially, would be a good person to answer that question, because that's, that's a bit more specific. But are there other people who would be in that position? A couple of you. Let's make sure we check with Christine, and if, if she doesn't have an answer, we'll get one for you, because that is important. That reminds me, too, I wanted to let you know, within <coughs> Office of Grad Programs and Research, which is just down the hall, 
We have a grad assistant for the next couple weeks who's available to give advice as you develop your proposal. This is primarily uh, help in navigating the websites if you're having trouble with that. If you want some basic editorial feedback, her name is Victoria and you can actually schedule a half an hour appointment with her to go over that. I would suggest you do that soon because if you wait until 48 hours before the deadline, she's going to be swamped. But we do have that help available right in, right in our office down the hall. And I think her number is here in the brochure where we can check. I wanted to move to some of the mechanics of developing your proposal. And Mary alluded to this both in terms of the amount of time. Another thing that I've heard students say, and Jordan, I'd be interested in your experience, get lots of feedback. Get lots of eyes on this. Expect to go through multiple drafts um, because every time you refine it, it's probably getting tighter, clearer, more focused, more comprehensible. So I know, but how did you work with that when you were developing your proposal? Lots of time, first of all. <laughs> Give yourself as much time as possible. If you have senior students that you're working with in your lab under your same supervisor, even if they're other master students, PhD students, postdocs, I would say they're one of the biggest resources because like everyone is saying and everyone knows academics are busy you guys can sit here and be modest but the truth is they don't have a lot of time and it's best to get as many eyes on your proposal as you can so use those people and then if you can get feedback from your supervisor on every third or fourth draft that you're going through with the colleagues in your lab I think that was um, what I did and they, those students in your lab, if you have that resource, will probably also have applied for these types of awards, so they might have examples that you can look at, and if they're working in the same field, they'll have lots of helpful advice. And as Mary said, for those of you who aren't in a lab context, if you see someone else here from your program or your department, make a deal to provide that support to each other, and tell each other, let me know, give me the hard stuff, you know, tell me, Tell me if there's something that you just don't understand or that is not clear and, and invite that from each other. Yeah. In terms of question two, sort of the best way to prepare this, um, any, I think we've spent a lot of time on this, but I want to ask if there's anything else people want to add specific to that point. Well, I, I'm going to emphasize again for PhDs that you're going to send your proposal to your peers, send the CV part to your peers. Because mm -hmm. that's, we, we, again, the, the privileging of that is, 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 is wonderful, but the reality is when I'm looking at it in front, I, I, I look at everything. And, um, and we, the, I know the last couple committees, it's no longer, there, there, I think there are sometimes set percentages, but sometimes it's left to the reviewer to determine. With the masters, I think we, we are held to something yeah. a little bit more. The um, is a percent the, it, but the, the doctoral, the doctoral is, is kind of, yeah. so your CV does, so do, and just even the way that you present it, how you put it on the page, is really important. Yeah. Um, so all that, again, we do get swayed to the 90% on the proposal, but as uh, uh, Jordan's evaluation was on the whole picture, so he, he paid a lot of attention there, but he also had to pay attention on the other parts as well. That reminds me of something else we've addressed in other, other sessions like this in past years, and it fits with something Mary said about this being a brochure. Think about who the Government of Canada and the Tri-Council wants to fund. Why did they create this program? Who, who do they want to support? They're interested in developing the next generation of Canadian academics and researchers. For those of us, particularly in education, and I know in some programs in KIN, for us, development of the profession and development as researchers, the lines are kind of fuzzy because we're often engaged in both. When you write this proposal, you want to sound like an academic and a scholar because they're looking for researchers. And I think this can fit with the language you use in your CV as well. Sometimes you may be describing the same experience, but as Mary said, make it a brochure. Choose language that emphasizes your academic self and your developing researcher self, because that's what they're looking for. If you have had experience in a school, um, in an athletic team that is very relevant to what you're doing, you can put it in, but then make sure you, you help the reader see the relevance and why that makes you the best person to be conducting this project, because you already have frontline experience with this age group of kids, with the you know athletes in this particular area, or people with this particular health condition. 
Um, so if it's part of who you are, you want to present that, but you want to make the link to the research that you plan to do. Okay. Yes? Are there any examples CMEs as well? Do you have examples of proposals that are for reading? That I don't think we have, but it would be something that I would say one of the people, many of our departments also have sessions for students, and if you talk to the graduate advisors in your department, and if you need that person's name, I can provide that. Um, they may have some or help you put you in touch with more senior students who would be willing to share one. And they'll know who's successful. And so, some of the competitions, you have to use the common CV anyways. That's true. So there, And check the formatting of that. One area that we haven't talked about much um, and that is, is really critical is what should you think about when selecting your referees? Mary, I'm not sure that you said much about this. Do you want to add a comment to that before you have to sure. scoot out? I would say uh, my last two words, be bold. <laughs> so you might uh, be really intimidated. You might uh, be first or second year and be really intimidated about asking the person, someone in your department, maybe you're just starting to work with someone, but if they're the most qualified person, again, with this peer review concept, if they're a reviewer of your work, someone who can say why this work is important, if they're the most knowledgeable person in your field, then figure out how to get them to agree to write you a letter. Sometimes at the beginning, people have to rely, again, PhD students, somebody they worked with at the master's level, master's level students, somebody that they worked with when they were doing their honors thesis. So make sure that you have one kind of anchor person, somebody who you've known for a while, who has an academic position, who is someone who would be recognized as having the knowledge such that their assessment, this is excellent research and here are the three reasons why, and here's why this person is the best person to carry out this research. That person matters. And then cultivate the new person. If you don't have that second person yet, you need to just set your anxiety aside <laughs> and decide how you're going to cultivate the relationship with that person. And in part, you can really convey, it's about being professional. You can convey to this person how are you going to make it feasible for them to write another letter? They already, this year I have, I don't know, six or seven letters to write for new people. So brand new from scratch letters. But if somebody came to me and they said, look, I'm doing this research, it's in your field, I know that I'm going to be asking you to join my committee, I can create, for me, Dropbox, yes, thank you, I can create a folder in Dropbox, I can put the proposal there, I can give you a cheat sheet for how to assess my CV, I can give you a summary of what this project is about. I would actually seriously think about adding that letter writing to my to-do list because ultimately, and I'm sure this is true for my colleagues, we want you to be successful. So you can help us to help you to be successful just by managing the information overload part of it, being really professional, take the time. Read the most significant, recent, important publication that this person has written and make it clear to them that you've read their work. There's a reason why you're coming to talk to them. You've cited their work in your proposal. Something could be as simple as that. <laughs> Cite their work. And then they will probably agree to write you a letter. And don't just think about it. Because sometimes the more you think about it, the more anxious and so on and so forth, you're imagining how the conversation is going to go. And the response. Really, exactly. And they're going to say no. They probably won't. If you help them to say yes. Help them to say yes, and chances are they will. Or get, ask your supervisor, do you know this person? Can you uh, introduce me to this person? Can, uh, do you have any advice for how this person might agree to write me a letter? Mm -hmm. just, just do it. Um, 
what if you have, I have my supervisor as my primary, but then say that I published with someone else, but I didn't publish my master's thesis yet. So should I ask my master's thesis supervisor for my second one, or should I ask the person that I published with? Who do you think would write a stronger letter? Um, probably the person that I published with. Then I'd ask okay. them. I wasn't too sure if it looks better. I don't, yeah, would you I guys have? I think there's a recommendation though in the in the shirt form that says yeah. something about a master's mm -hmm. supervisor. Okay. It's not it's required, but I think it's recommended. So. Okay. Okay. Hmm. What I might do. Yeah. One of the things, depending on how well you know these people, what you could do is write to the person you published with and say, could you give me a paragraph on what you saw as my contribution to that publication and send it to my master supervisor? Because then your master supervisor can include that person's perspective uh, in the letter they're writing for you. So sometimes you can get two voices into one letter that way. Um, writing letters of reference is part of our job. And I, I want to emphasize what Mary said, that we really do want you to be successful. But as she also said, when you're getting multiple requests, making sure you give us time to do a good job. Because the detail and the level of detail in the letter is really important. So, Jordan, how did you approach folks? How did you decide? Because uh, you're a master's student, right? I was, just, yeah. Yeah, so did a, this um, is a master's I, I guess I was a little bit lucky. I, I obviously had a letter from my proposed research supervisor. Um, how many letters are there for the masters? Two. 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 And then I, I would have had another one from working in a lab as an undergraduate. Okay. So, fortunately, mm -hmm. had, had people that you knew quite well. People. Uh -huh. George and Cynthia, what would you add to the whole yeah. letters of reference? Question? I think you want to select people who can speak to your academic potential. And really, the whole this whole process of writing the SHRC or the affiliated and the CIU charter is really looking at your potential, your research mm -hmm. potential. So choose people who you, who you know can speak to that, not the friend down the street who is an academic, but someone who who really knows your work and can put those details into it, as Mary had mentioned, can speak specifically about your master's thesis or can speak specifically about the publication or the presentation that you've done. So those details are really important, and it sets those letters apart from the others because there's really only about a, this much room, maybe about a paragraph that we have to write, sure. but it, it's short and it needs to be really focused. And, it, and we don't want to say just exactly the same thing that you already have in your package. We want it to stand out. So we want to talk about how how your your work is going to be a contribution to the field. We want to talk about your strengths. We want to provide all those details. So the more you can give your supervisor or the person writing the letter, I think the better. So it's really important who you choose. And you might also you know, provide them with, I think SHRC also comes with a, a list of things that you can give a letter, a, a referee, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a set of points. So you might even just provide that to the referee and say, here, here are some points to consider in writing the letter that might be helpful. Yeah. I have a question. Sorry, again. So, Shirk on the online has a reference form, and then the affiliated has a reference form. So, do you need two separate references from the same person? Which form do you use? <laughs> Again, let's thought, I thought the affiliated just got um, considered. Yeah, it may be there because, for example, international students are not eligible to apply for all of these, so that may be one of the reasons there too. But again, let's we can try and make sure we get a clear answer to this. Yeah, in the back. Um, so I I'm just starting my PhD, but my master's is actually course based at another institution, but my undergrad is here. So I'm struggling to pick where to get my letters of reference because I know the people that knew my academic potential back then, but then left and now I'm back, but I've connected with them again. But I also feel like maybe I should use people that knew my most recent work, but I, I... <laughs> George, how would you answer that as someone mm -hmm. who's done reviews? Yeah. First of all, don't uh, apologize for doing a course base uh, uh, these uh, and masters because I think people come in different uh, different ones. Um, I'd probably go with the more uh, the graduate classes were probably uh, more research oriented, unless but you might have had a, a senior undergraduate class where there was a lot of uh, indication where they could they could talk about research promise for you. Um, maybe one from each. 
if you have a really good relationship with one of them from here and that they feel comfortable to speak to the, your forthcoming project. But I would be, if I was reading your file and I saw two undergraduate, uh, references from your undergraduate and you did a full graduate degree, my first question would be, well, why didn't uh, they ask someone from their graduate program? Not saying that that would leave, but it, I, might, I would be left with that question. And I, I think it's, and again, you guys correct me if you have a different experience, to not have some letter from the person who's going to be the research supervisor of your current degree, I think would raise flags. Because that person has in some way agreed to support you. That's a supervisor's role. Yeah. And to not have a letter from that person, I think, is problematic. It's so kind of expected. Yes, yes. Okay. And one, one thing I can say related to that, and we kind of jump, jumped over this, um, make, we've said make it as easy as possible for your supervisor, but let me make a, that a bit more specific, particularly if you're just getting to know this person. I would actually, with your CV, annotate it and say, you know, in, not every single entry, but if there's something where you think the link between that experience uh, is not clear, say to your supervisor, I believe this illustrates blah, blah, blah. I had a PhD student a number of years ago who was a, a competitive athlete at a very high level and was coming back to do a PhD. And we talked about the fact that this person had dedicated such extraordinary resolve, discipline, whatever they put their mind to, they, they completed. She was tackling an ambitious research project and I was able to say, given what I've learned about her uh, past experience, I'm highly confident she's going to do just a superlative job. So even though being an athlete wasn't immediately relevant, it, w it was an argument I could make and she was, she was successful. So those sorts of things, making suggestions to your supervisor, you know, here's some things you might wish to point out. I'll still choose whether I include them, but don't be shy about offering that. There are a couple other questions, or hands up, I noticed. Did we? Yes. Um, so for my master, uh, for I'm in the master. So if I was to get a referee from someone currently that I would want to supervise me, and then another one, would it be better to be to get an excerpt from someone I worked really close with in their lab and got to know better um, versus the person I did my honors thesis in publish with? Like, would it be better to have do better to have um, my honors thesis supervisor write a letter and have a blurb from the other faculty member that I worked closer with, or vice versa? So yeah, I would say your honors thesis supervisor that would be a good. Especially if you did a publication with that person, because I could speak right to that. Because as George mentioned, if I if I'm looking through the application and I notice there isn't. Um, a letter from the master's supervisor um, or a previous supervisor on his thesis, then I wonder why. And it could be that it uh, could be in another part of the world that it's hard to get that letter, or it could be many years ago, and that might come out in the application. But if it was just a couple of years ago, I would start to wonder, okay, what happened there? You know, and, and begin to wonder. <laughs> Does it mean, it just makes me think, you know, what's the situation? Just because the, the other faculty member, what her, like her research is relevant it might be something to have a more in-depth conversation with your supervisor, um, but I think in general the rule of, because a supervisor has primary responsibility for shepherding your work at that point in time, so that, that gives it a little bit of extra weight. I just wanted to, to make a couple of comments. Like when, I'm, I'm thinking now when, I, when I'm ranking proposals for masters or PhDs and I'm looking at the letters of reference as we're speaking about that, I usually give myself like a number out of 10 just so that I, and by and large, if I'm looking at 100 applications, probably 70 to 80% of them I'm going to give like 8 out of 10 because that's kind of, I, and then there's going to be a few of them that are, that for whatever reason you selected someone um, that wasn't really relevant. It was someone from, uh, people will put sometimes a, a college that they took one class from, and I kind of go, well, that really doesn't help that, or the letter really doesn't really, is not a really strong letter. The person that you asked, which you don't know, but they actually wrote you a not a very strong letter. So that sinks it below eight. And then there's going to be a few of them, and I'm trying to think, Mary said something that 90% uh, of the letters are, are always saying, what a wonderful student, what a wonderful project. 
and I'm trying to think of what are the letters that, and I always, there, we have, that stand out, that give, that bump me from that eight, that student from an eight to a nine or a ten. There are always a few, and there's, a, there's some colleagues in this department who just know how to write really good letters, and it's not because they use superlatives, it's because they don't use superlatives. Now, how do you get to know who does that? I don't think that's possible. But I think having uh, Mary's two words, remember what she said? Be bold. Be bold. I think sometimes, I have students that come to me, can you write me a strong letter? And then my first reaction is like, you think I wouldn't write you a strong letter? Or, and, <laughs> but, and, you know, it'd be very hard for me to say, no, I can't write you a strong letter. But there's a, some, sometimes a sense that you need to have people who are going to write you a strong letter. And the, to, so all I'm saying is that most of you will fit into that 8 out of 10. So play it. I don't want to say play it safe, but if you're having your supervisor, your supervisor supports you. So going too much out of the box risks going sometimes under eight or... But by and large, the letter of reference counts it well if you do all the right things that you're hearing here. But it's not, for me, as an indicator, it's not the make or break thing. Mm -hmm. It's not the make or break. Most people, as I said, probably 80% of you will all have the same exact score on my rankings and probably a lot of my colleagues too so it matters a great deal to do it well and so that that would be my advice on that and maybe maybe one way to approach that is as you're looking at your experiences to date work school whatever maybe you've done volunteer things what's something you feel particularly proud of and what is it about that experience that you're proud of? Because that may help you capture either a personal quality or a contribution or the way you got interested in grad school and research that can then get captured. And that could be one of the things you suggest to your supervisor or letter writer. And because it's so uniquely about you, it could be one of those things that leads to something that makes it sound a little different. Um, yeah. And, and it, with your supervisor, for those of you who are relatively new, not only ask, who else do you think I might approach to write a letter? You can say, who do you think w has a reputation for writing strong letters? Because we hear a little bit of that um, and can point you in the right direction. I want to make another point about, because many of you are beginning your programs, and um, letter writing for faculty who take it seriously is... I find I'll take at least an hour to write a letter of reference, and in any and then as my PhDs are graduating now and they're applying for jobs, so th this is this might be the first letter they're writing for you, but just think about it as a marathon. That th most of you will hopefully be s successful and, and stay around, and that supervisor, or that person, going to be writing you a lot of letters um, a along the way. So that relationship is actually very important, not for only for awards, for jobs, etc. But be mindful of that. Um, uh, the thank you, um, the small card, or whatever it is that works. You don't need to go and get a bottle of wine for every letter of reference, because some of us might have like a wine cellar full, um, because uh, you have graduate students who are applying for a lot of jobs. So, but be, it, for me, it makes a difference. And I think for my colleagues, too, that you've acknowledged to say, I really appreciate you writing that letter. And whatever which way or form you do that, um, I think is, uh, is up to you. But the acknowledgement, because the non-acknowledgement, those are the ones that, that I kind of go, wow, wow. The, the, um, it's, it is part of our job, as Beth said, but it is one of those parts of our job that's uh, it's kind of an add-on, an, an add especially if it's not the student that you're supervising, that the, the other letter. So be, be very mindful of that, that um, because you will be probably asking that person for up to, I don't know about you, but some students have probably written over 25 letters for them because they're applying for various awards, jobs, etc. So um, it's a long relationship. And it, so it becomes even more important down the road, actually, mm -hmm. for you and for, for them. So that would be my advice as a beginning, in the beginning process. Any, yes, in the back. Um. Uh, I guess I'm asking specifically about, uh, I'm a master's student in international and I'm asking specifically, I suppose, about the, about the affiliated fellowship application. Uh, I'm trying to understand the anatomy of, of, the, uh, of the application. I think I got it with regards to um, references, where one of them is coming from a supervisor uh, who will kind of 
say, okay, yeah, this, this works, this is promising. And, and uh, the other one is uh, a little bit more perplexing to me. So I guess I'm in a situation, well, I'm hearing a lot of people talk about uh, their undergrad work, especially by the honors thesis. Um, I, back in the States, I did a thesis. Uh, frankly, it wasn't my best work. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather, I put the title of it on my CV, but I'd rather people not ask about it. I have work that's much, much, much stronger in other um, education fields, uh, education classes. But here in Canada, is that is the thesis seen as like the pinnacle of your undergraduate career? That if it weren't, if it weren't talked about, then that would be a big issue. As an undergraduate, Cynthia, do you have as the as your honors thesis, or just a is that what you're referring to? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah, I think you can just list it. You don't need to go into that much more detail than that if you don't want to. I, I don't think you're required. You're not required to select a referee who you think might hurt you. Yeah. So if that was not a very positive experience, or you, you aren't proud of the work, um, I wouldn't take the risk. If you if you think there's a risk, that would be a really lukewarm or not a strong letter, then I would go for somebody else. So it's not like they're gonna, it's not like the uh, person judging the applications will be looking for that, for a master's student will be looking for that, that uh, thesis. You, you also said it was some time ago, right? Uh, about two years ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I was assuming it was then. But you've done other work since then, you're saying? Um, research work? No, teaching? Yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'll, yeah. I can discuss this more after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think you I are in a... Yeah, and I mean, it may be a bit of a dilemma, but I think still you want to go with strong letters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Again, people who can speak to your research potential. Right? Mm -hmm. so that's, that's who you want to choose. And, that, and you want to be, help them be specific about what they can write about in that letter to, to your potential. So you obviously have some, otherwise you wouldn't be here now, right? Yeah. And so there are people who will be able to, and you had some letters to be able to get into the program. Yeah. You're in, mm -hmm. so maybe even asking those people. So they, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would sort of think about it in that sense, and not worry about it. Okay. The other thing I wanted to say to to the group, because again, we want you all to be successful. It's quite likely that not everybody will be successful on the first on the first try. Um, but this is not the only award competition that's available to you. That I really think it's so important to go ahead and get an application in because first of all only by having an application in do you have a chance of being successful so no that's number one right but number two you'll learn a lot and there are other award competitions that come up during the year we've got a number of student awards there's a dean of education scholarship there are a couple of other small endowed awards some of them aren't financially particularly great they may just be five hundred dollars but if you then are applying for SHRC CHR next year, you now have a competitively judged award to put on your CV. So whatever you do for your application this fall, you now basically have a proposal ready for every other award competition that comes up this winter. And if you receive one of those, you've automatically increased your chances of being successful with Tri-Council next year. So as a couple people said, this is an evolution. You're beginning a process, and it's. Uh, I can't underestimate how valuable it is, even if you have the disappointment of not actually getting a shirk or CIHR this year. Yeah, because your department is. Uh, you're you're showcasing your work for the department members as well, and if you're lucky enough to get to the next level, of the faculty, you're showcasing it there. And I think that it's a trickle. I mean, academia is a long. It's a it's a long journey, and many of you will go from the masters to a PhD, and then you're. Your work keeps being recognized. I wonder if we can speak to the um, the reality of the affiliated award, because um, I think it used to be a place where there were a number of awards, but it's dwindled and dwindled down. And it'd be nice to know the reality of it. I know the FOGS or the Faculty of Graduate Studies and Postgraduate Studies can probably tell us realistically what are the amount of awards there. Um, because they put a lot of that money into the four-year fellowships, if I'm correct. No they, no, they can't take that money and put it in the four-year. The, the affiliated awards primarily come from external donors who've established okay. awards, so they're endowments. Some of you may be too young, really, to remember the 2007 financial crash. <laughs> but, but certainly when we went through the financial downturn, 
however many years ago, not, a little less than 10 years ago, the markets crashed, all the endowments crashed. So they had to go in and reset the amount of money UBC was permitted to take out of the endowments, and they set a more conservative strategy. So some money went back in to recapitalize or, t or fill those up again. And that's one of the major reasons that some had to be probably put on the shelf for a while until they could kind of get healthy and generate funds, or the amounts um, are less than they used to be. Because many of them come from gifts and endowments, they may be targeted for a specific purpose. So there may be one that's only, you know, the Bombardier affiliated award is going to be for engineers. The one from a Heart and Stroke Foundation, you know, maybe there's some kin students who would be eligible for that, but not someone in language and literacy. The, the affiliated awards are listed on the Grad Studies website. Um, I think that particularly for international students, it's well worth doing because we have had students who've received them. Um, but again, it's a smaller pool, and that's part of what makes it quite competitive. That's what I'd say about that. And there seems to be some of the awards that are better specific to certain populations. Mm -hmm. right. So that was my other question for putting in just one application and not an affiliate application. And where do you indicate that you're fit at that population? I think there are opportunities. I think you can look for ways to highlight that, um, because if you think there's a good chance one of the th other things that I know is a challenge for our students is our, our success rate in SHRC and I believe NSERC are higher than they are for CIHR. Um, we have been increasing our success, which I'm really pleased about, but because this is the primary way of funding grad students in the health sciences, CIHR directs a lot of its money into traineeships which are awarded by departments. We receive just a small amount of that. So their pool of money for fellowships is actually uh, more limited, which is why they become more competitive. So if our topic is kind of borderline, and you choose language that would fit into either, perhaps go for sure, instead of have, has this been discussed in Kin, and what it advice has, have you heard about so. that? Because I, I can comment as C well, but I'd be interested in what you say. CIHR is incredibly competitive. And, I mean, they all are, but that specific, it specifically is because of the reasons that you're talking about. So the advice I've always gotten from faculty members is if you are on the borderline, and you're, I think it's really important that your supervisor holds both, um, if you don't <coughs> apply for SHRC or, or NSERC if that's a possibility. Yeah. And one of the things to be aware of, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, probably about four or five years, four or five years ago, SHRC stopped funding anything that was health related, yeah. just period. Their budgets were dropping and they felt we've got to go back to our core commitment to social sciences, humanities research, looks like health, we're not going to touch it, okay? So you even, if you do apply for SHRC, you have to be very careful about your language, about your population, and your research question. Um, it is possible, but it has to feel genuine to you, because when you receive awards, you also have to submit reports, um, and your supervisor has to talk about progress. It has to, fit, if you're then beginning to generate publications, if your publications all look like they're going to you know, the Journal of Heart and Stroke Wellness or whatever, and you're saying, oh, I'm sure it's going to look kind of suspicious. Um, I had a student a number of years ago. Her primary interest was in eating disorders, but what she was interested in was mutuality and friendships and how those could be a source of support as someone was recovering from disordered eating. What she ended up doing was saying, wow, what I'm really interested in is the theoretical question about mutuality as a protective factor. And so she ended up setting aside the eating disorders population, looking at job loss. So if somebody has a job loss, is mutuality and friendship a protective factor in weathering that stressful situation? That took it outside of health. She was successful. She got a master shirk. But you have... You don't want to do that to a point where you feel like you're turning yourself into a pretzel and doing something you absolutely don't want to do. It's almost better to just continue looking for other sources of funding, push for CIHR, um, and do what, do what you really care about. It's tricky, yeah, because development is kind of borderline if you're looking at development, because it, it straddles social, emotional, mm -hmm. so that's where it's, 
it's hard to know if these part of what does it go to CISR and these development does it go to SHRC? Part of what we've seen is that if you have a very education-focused question, you're doing this in schools, kids who don't have particular special needs that would sound health-related, um, then you probably have a pretty good chance of that. That helps with the SHRC argument. Yeah, You had a question, too. So I, I, it wasn't clear to me on the SHRC website about um, intervention research, which is what I'm aiming to do. But it sounds like maybe like I, I was thinking maybe I better do the CIHR, but... Depends on what you're intervening with. If you're intervening with reading troubles, you're probably okay. If you're intervening... Down syndrome, positive behavior support. Behavior support? Yeah. Um, you, you might be able to stick with SHRC. I would say discuss with your supervisor because they've probably, in your own area, I'm sure now that we're about five years in, they've grappled with this question. Mm -hmm. And so I'd, I'd have a really explicit and discussion. It was, it was confusing because I had a couple of, my supervisor had given me a couple of um, successful SHRC applications, and they were both intervention research with kids with autism or whatever. Okay. So, but then we read this little niggly thing on the, on the website and kind of... Look at the those. date. Look at the date of those successful applications. If okay. they were before 2009, I might be more concerned if they're a little more recent, then they might be a good model for how to present that to a SHRC audience. Yeah. I wanted to, oh, oh, sure. oh sorry, yes. For the masters, I just want to be clear, for the masters application, you still have to like, decide if you're either applying for SSHRC or CIHR. Like, gear your proposal towards one of those. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think you I'm not sure. Does CIHR offer master's fellowships? They so may not. Yeah, do they? they do. Oh, they do? Okay. Then, yes, you would have to decide one or the other. Yeah, yeah. Are you talking about because it's all harmonized now? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't understand I, why it's harmonized. I thought that on the application you still check the box. Health research, basic science, social science. On the app, I thought. Yeah. I, th I think that's correct. If it's, I haven't looked at that particular application. They will not send it. If SHRC looks at it and says, oh, this doesn't fit us, this looks more health related, they will not send it to CIHR. They leave it up to you to make that decision. Send to the granting council that you think is most appropriate. Hmm. Right, well, our last question. Did you have another follow up? I have another question. Sure. Yeah. And one effect in your understanding that once you receive a, like, shirk once, you're not going to be able to get it again year? That say that again. Once like, you receive a shirk? say year one you get a shirk rent, you're not going to get a shirk rent with your two. Is this true? Or um, at the master's level, Tri-Council has guidelines about when you can apply. And depending on how long you've been in your graduate program, you may go beyond the period of eligibility. For master's students, this means the window is pretty narrow because most master's programs are two years. Doctoral students, not successful first year, you certainly can apply in your second year. And shirks may be awarded for different time frames. So sometimes people just get a one-year shirk, some people get a three-year shirk. So that can differ. If you're holding a shirk, no, you don't apply for another one because you have it for your term. If you uh, probably by the time, and if you got a one-year shirk, by the time that was finished, you would be beyond the eligibility to apply again, just in terms of how long you've been in your program. For those of you who are applying this fall, you'll learn whether or not you're successful sometime next spring. And then the funding begins basically for next year. Mm -hmm. So if it's a one-year shirk, you will then be at the end of year two um, when you're applying again. So that, it, if, there, if your situation is a little different, sometimes we have people who transfer from one grad program to another, and then how you count the time becomes a bit more complicated, and we typically make sure we check with grad studies about those questions, just so you're getting good information. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Um, I just wanted to clarify, um, you're talking about awards, and then if you won an award, you or something like a fellowship, does that play well on the shirt application? Like that's the stuff that you can get points for? Or? Jordan, what advice have you received about that? Or what have you been told about the value of awards on fellowship applications? My advice 
that I've been given and that I would give is to apply for absolutely everything. Okay, Holding what, academic what, awards. If you have stuff when you are applying, does that work in your favor? Is that of course. Is yeah. Yeah. you're writing about whatever you've done? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's, uh, you're entering into a world where you have to show what you've done in, in a humble, but you have to be, so yeah, no, the awards are, I know in our depart at the department level for us, we do percentage, like there's boxes that you get 10 points for this, 10 for that, 10 for that, and 10 is for awards. So um, whether everyone grades them or, or marks them that way, that's kind of a, uh, at the department level. So yeah, that's, it's huge. And there's going to be a continuum in terms of, and this fits with what Mary was saying, what is sort of the, you know, prototypic award you'd want to get. It would be like, you know, best honors thesis in the entire university. Wow, that would be fantastic if you could put that down. And then there's a continuum from that to, you know, nominated by the department for something down to, you know, my dog won first place in the Abbotsford Pet Show, you know, and I got an award for best dog handler, you know. Really? <laughs> no, I didn't. I've, I've never done that. That's great. <laughs> but I just made it up. <laughs> best, you know, best pie or something. Um, so those you probably are not going to list. That would be what Mary would describe as filler. Uh, but again, in the middle, there you have to make a judgment call. What if you were voted um, best science teacher in your district, and you're now doing a master's degree in science education? I don't know. Cynthia, would you put that down? Yeah, I would mm -hmm. put all those awards down. Yeah. I think but not that, the dog show. Well, well, I, I think it all depends because <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what you're doing, you know. Yeah. Sir, yeah. Well, it depends on how you can make the connection well, between exactly. what it is that you're doing. But I yeah. think that the um, the CV, if you highlight your academic potential, but also your leadership yes. potential, your community yes. engagement, all of those things work towards helping give a better picture of. Of, of what you're able to offer and how you stand out versus somebody else. So I would put all of that, you know, I think about those other, other kinds of awards that <laughs> Beth is talking about. We have to make the case for how that fits, but thinking about leadership, community engagement, research potential, those are all things that I use when I assess applications. And the faculty yeah. of education to teaching things, like we, yeah. we, we value teaching. Mm -hmm. And in Kin, Sports leadership, coaching. If yeah. you if you've been a volunteer coach yeah. for a kids or a disadvantaged kids athletic mm -hmm. team, that would probably be very relevant. Yes. I just had a um, clarifying question about the short window you mentioned in the masters, mm -hmm. the masters application. Um, do you are you supposed to apply the year before you start your thesis or the first year of your program? First year. And you can't in the second year. I don't yeah. remember what the exact amount is, but because you would only if you're in your second year and you don't hear until the following spring, that's the spring of your second year in your program. And they expect you to finish a master's degree basically in two years. So it would be seen as okay. you're, you, should you're be done. you should be done very soon, so why would we give you a year of funding? Okay. So you apply in your first year for your second year? Okay. For a master's student. Yeah. Yes, in the back. So if we're applying uh, for a first year it's as a master's level, and we only have academics for you know a few summer courses we've taken at this point, at the master's level. How does that affect us if we're rating 70% on our GPA? So your, your undergrad becomes... Oh, okay. Okay. Becomes pretty, more important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the grad classes that you've taken already would, would all be, also be factored in. Yeah. This brings us to the, the question about what do you include in your description of track record? Um, because And also, we don't all have perfect track records. You know, some of us uh, did our BA or BEd or BSC years ago when we were a little less serious about life. And uh, so there may be some kind of spotty things there. Um, any of you want to comment on how to deal with that, if, if it's worthwhile to allude to it or to ask a referee to allude to it? And if so, how do you handle those kind of dark spots on your record? Well, you certainly don't want to bring up the dark spots. <laughs> don't shine any light on those dark spots. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think working with your supervisor to figure out you know what would be the best things to include or not is probably the best bit of advice that I, I can give on that. Um, and I think you know best in terms of what it is you want to highlight and what what about yourself you want to put forward. So and then the common the common CV is what you have to use, right? The online version. First, I don't know. For, for some. For some of them, for CHR. 
For Shirk as well? I think is that part of the harmonization? I think there's just a, Are they giving it to folks who looked at it? I don't yeah. think they did. I don't think it's the same as the IHR. Okay. Okay. So I know there's just a box you can yeah. fill in with your publications and another box we can list maybe some of, of your volunteer work or community work. Or okay. So there's just places where you can put some of that. So you have to sort of think about you know, what, what, will, what will stand out and what, what's not going to raise a flag and what connects with your program to get this big picture of yourself that you want to put in. But yeah, I would highlight any. What if, what if you, um, during your undergraduate years, one of your parents was very ill and you ended up mm -hmm. having to devote a lot of time to family care, caregiving, yeah, that's a good what point. would you do with something like that? There's usually yeah, there's a, a special like circumstances that. box mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. on I think on the applications that you can explain yeah. black spots. Yeah. Well, if your grades are really low one year or something like that, and you can explain why, maybe you needed to take a leave of absence for health consideration. But you can, yeah. There's usually a box to explain that. That I've seen for faculty. You do see the yeah. uh, the faculty awards. People do put things there because of they've had two children in the span of two years or whatever. Um, for students, uh, sick leave is I've, I've seen that, or for personal personal reasons, and I think that I think that's that's a valuable thing to put there. And sometimes they give international students will give a bit of a context um, because the reader may not know that in South Africa, a sixty percent or whatever is 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 actually we we get those stats from grad studies. They help us evaluate that. But sometimes when we as the reviewer. It, it's nice for us to see that as well. So if your context was quite unusual to the reviewers here, I would I would recommend doing that. We usually just get a, for in terms of grades, we usually, someone does all the work for us and they'll say undergrad 81.67 average. So that's what we look at. And I personally look at, like, because a number of us have been at different universities, certain universities to get an 81 at McGill or um, is it sometimes different from other institutions? And I hate to say it, but that, you know, names of places do matter to committee members. We try to, you try to be neutral, you try to be neutral, um, but there's something that um, certain colleges or universities do make a difference, and that's where it kind of plays a difference. Um, and I would say more because of what it communicates, and some of that may be based on assumptions, um, yeah. But if the assumption is it's harder to get that 81 at McGill, it, it's this is a this is a solid mark. Or different disciplines have different grading practices. If you did your undergrad in computer engineering and grades there have a very different distribution, um, it might not be a bad idea to say to your supervisor or include, you know, yes, this was my GPA, but it was at this percentile for my graduating class because that can that can convey that information. Let me go to the back and then come up. Yeah. So if I'm, in, I'm in the MN right now, and I'm probably going to try to switch over to the MA. So then, if that's the case, who would, I, would I be able to apply a second year possibly for this, or is it only, is it only like first year? It would only be bec just because you won't have enough time left in your program. So okay. they so they actually sit, there's a guideline that says you may apply if you're within the first X months of your graduate degree. So, but that, but I think that going ahead and, I mean, I think this information is yeah. useful for any applications, and so, and there will be some others coming up. Yeah. I think you, you can apply as an MA. I don't think you, you need can. to be an MA. I think so. We should check on that. You have to be a full-time student. Yeah, yeah. full-time student is the main thing, but I yeah. don't think you needed, I'm pretty sure I don't think that was the case. But we can check it. We can check. We should check. Because they changed it. They changed it. Yeah, I'd like to know that. Okay. I think, and the challenge would be whether who, whoever's going to be your supervisor makes the argument that you're going to be doing a research degree. Because again, you know, and what, there can be something like you know, a master's of music uh, or something. And again, it's what is the scholarly component of that? Because that's, that would be an important piece. Of it. We talked about what else to include in your description of track record, and I think depending on, we have students who often come back after some time, after having completed a bachelor's degree, so there can be questions that come up in this area. Anything that folks want to say about that, Jordan? Cynthia already alluded to it, but I think a lot of the time you need to demonstrate your commitment to your community and things outside mm -hmm. of academia. 
that's always been feedback that I've gotten from professors on mm -hmm. on applications. Any particular ways or examples or the ways that you did that? Like activities or yeah, I mean whatever volunteering that you do, whether it's with sports teams or education or hospitals or disabled populations or anything like that. Mm, great. Anything you guys want to add to track record? I think if we can spin it honestly and like if you've led workshops at your school or your you sit on the uh, some of you might be in IB schools and you've done training and so something that shows leadership and uh, since I'm, Cynthia mentioned community engagement especially for the masters I think th those are some of the criteria that we're looking you're the future leaders whether so the research is emphasized but the leadership part I think is huge so don't be shy that if you've taken leadership type opportunities in your um, particular uh, educational context to put that there but if you can spin it mm -hmm. to something research wise and research is a it's got a large spectrum mm -hmm. bring it there but again honestly because there's going to be someone on the board that's going to detect that that was so don't you can't push it too far yeah. <laughs> but it's a question here then I'll talk to you so yeah so on that I had a question I worked for with a population that's related to a potential research thesis. So how important does community involvement become? Because I do feel like I'm involved in the community and giving back to the community in that way. So like is it necessary to also have a volunteer position to show that I'm working with Cynthia, what would you how would you answer? I'm not I'm not um, familiar exactly with the uh, the form and where you can put those pieces in there, but if you can list, you know, some of the work that you've done with particular populations and what maybe you've achieved in that, maybe you started a particular group or you set up a, you know, series of focus group meetings to in order to design a particular kind of intervention. I'm not too sure what was involved in the volunteer work, but if there's something that led to something being an action that was kind of as a result of your work, then I would I could put that in. They don't necessarily know that that would be eventually might be the group that you might work with. And your proposal itself is not a contract. I mean, you don't need to, if you get funded on this proposal, you don't need to actually carry that out. Mm -hmm. you know, so there's nothing there to say that it could be the same or different. I guess the question is how much weight does volunteer work carry if like my, yeah. my employed job is very much you know, working in the community? Paid I think versus volunteer? <coughs> is that what you mean? Paid yeah. versus... I, I think it could count if it's with that population you're working with. I mean, you think of people who are TAs or research assistants. We value that a lot. They're paid yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. So we it's value it. So Yeah, it's the experience. So I think if yeah. volunteer is not more than uh, paid work, I think if it's targeted... And, and each of you, each of you is assembling a slightly... Of, in fact, a, a very different portrait, a very individual portrait because you want that entire application to make the case you're the best person to be doing that work. So some people might list a volunteer contribution in one box. Someone else might say in their program of study, um, I became interested in this work through my exposure to such and such community, which gave me a heightened awareness of their resilience and their struggle. So maybe you slide it in somewhere else. But again, as you think about where to put things, if it's, if it's not immediately apparent, think about the whole picture you're creating. And mm -hmm. it's sort of like if you think of a painting, whether that big blotch of red goes here or here or here, it still contributes to the, to the whole world. I thought I saw another hand up. Cotton. Yes, thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, just with that P&D assisting in teaching and volunteering, is it okay just to put volunteer this and taught this lesson, or do you need to describe how it fits into a proposal? What would you guys say? I think, so. I think if it does, it's great, but if it doesn't, yeah. I don't think that's necessary for everything that you want to put on there. I, mm -hmm. yeah. But, yeah, I agree. I mean, in a sense, what it does is fits towards helping the reviewer think about how you are the best person to do this work, and it gives evidence to show that you're committed to something, you've initiated something, you follow through with something, you know, so it may not be a one-to-one -one correspondence, but there might be something there that gives the reviewer something more than just what the proposal is. So. And some people have hobbies where they've 
they've achieved something that really is quite different than the research that they're doing, but again, represents achievement, and that's dedication, focus, talent. We're getting close to the end of our time, so, but I want to make sure that if you have other questions, we, we have a chance to answer those. What else do you want? Oh, I have one more thing that's absolutely critical that you must know. You must not send in a proposal with typographical errors and ideally grammatical errors. This is, this is like showing up to a job interview with a big blot of gravy on your shirt. You know, it, it creates the same bad impression. So as you go through those multiple, multiple drafts, ask your roommate, ask your partner, ask your 18-year-old to read and say anything that's misspelled, any typos. Um, and as George said, leave some white space just to rest your reader's eyes because it, it, and using headings, but that how it looks does make a difference. Yes? Um, so, of course, in uh, the teaching background, I'm immediately assuming that it's APA format. I'm assuming it's probably not, but is that at least included in that resource on the website here for that particular show? I think that if there is a generally accepted uh, yeah. editorial style for your discipline, use it, okay. and then use it correctly. There could be people in kin where it could be biomedical, uh, where references are cited differently. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would say is, it, like you said, totally depends on your field, but I would say for, I mean, I was in health research, I always use superscripted numbers and put a reference list at the end because it saves space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as opposed to putting full in-text citations. And mm -hmm. does the reference list put it in the account or two It does, yeah. but you can use abbreviated references. In okay. some of the applications, it has to fit on the page. Oh, really? For C uh, Yeah, on some and answer. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. But sure it's still definitely. saved space, though. <laughs> so it's very good no, I don't think so. The reference good. list is a different yeah, part different of it. Yeah. And then it's even better to use numbers yeah. if it's on a separate page. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there to go go in the medium. If you have like two or three, we will raise questions. But if you have like 35, then we'll also raise. So it's always that kind of happy medium yeah. with there too, because we're kind of flipping through them. But in most proposals, they don't use numbers. As well. No. I mean, it's more like the, what do we call the, ed, the, the sixth edition or the... Whatever edition mm -hmm. of the yeah, yeah. So you should say APA. Don't, yeah. So even though there, it's tempting to save space, if there's one um, editorial handbook that's typical of your discipline, I would stick with that, mm -hmm. because yeah. particularly because the superscripts are very health related. So if you're applying to Shirk and they say, why is this person using health yeah. citation style? They're going to say, is this a health proposal? So yeah. it would mm -hmm. perhaps yeah. raise uh, questions you don't want to raise. And again, don't forget that you're able to sign up for uh, half an hour with Victoria if you want editorial feedback, how an argument's playing, another set of eyes. She's available for that. You just need to sign up. And this is available um, information package, HTTP OGPR, grad funding resources, and encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, don't forget that you've got a departmental deadline, uh, September 22nd. Do not miss it. Um, make sure your references are, are aware of that because if their references aren't in, your department can't consider it. So um, we wish you the best of luck, not yes. only with this, but <laughs> with the coming year. It's great to have you all here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.